The wait is nearly over. Cyberpunk 2077 is set to release next week. Just saying that is almost unbelievable. On this channel, this is a game that I first began talking about all the way back in 2016, I believe. It's been a long time coming. And now we are here in single digits, just days from release. As was the case with Red Dead Redemption 2, content for Cyberpunk will continue post-launch. Down the road, I will discuss news related to story DLC and the mysterious standalone multiplayer game coming a few years from now, but also we'll discuss other highly anticipated games coming in the future, like the next Witcher installment. Today though, we have quite a bit of new Cyberpunk 2077 news, gameplay images, and details to discuss. This very well may be the last info dump before launch, and there's quite a bit to go through. Right now, if there's any concern at all that remains, well, we're seeing in various parts of the world launch day parties being announced, we're also seeing even more advertising and billboards going up, in Poland, one of the biggest retail chains is gearing up for the launch with giant displays, various game stores are getting shipping invoices for physical copies of the game, which are set to arrive in the coming days, in some areas of the world preload has supposedly already began, we are in December now, and based on this recent slide from a CDPR investor call, and everything we're actually seeing, it truly is the final big push. Additionally, CD Projekt Red just five days ago again reiterated, no more delays. But I'm sure most of you won't believe it until the game's in your hands and or being started for the first time. Also, for what it's worth, this is something that was blowing up the other day, but somebody got their hands on a leaked or stolen copy of Cyberpunk 2077 and were trying to sell it on eBay. Uh, it had 46 bids and was up to $4,000 just to play the game, maybe a couple of days early depending on shipping. Absolutely crazy. No idea if they actually sold it, but uh, yeah. Anyway, right now, as I said before, lots of new Cyberpunk 2077 details to discuss, but as usual, before we proceed forward, if you do go and do enjoy this content and want to show your support for videos like this, please consider hitting that like button, subscribing for more, and turning notifications on so you do not miss out on any new videos. Also, if you want to further support this channel, consider checking out my Patreon and consider contributing, and make sure to get geared up for this upcoming game by getting the new Samurai or Wanted t-shirt designs. If you're interested in getting these cyberpunk themed tees, there will be a link in the description down below. Nonetheless, we've seen Xbox Series X and Xbox One X gameplay. Just a number of days ago, we also saw PS5 and PlayStation 4 Pro gameplay. I don't believe I actually had a chance to discuss the new PlayStation gameplay, but overall, it looked impressive. While the gameplay didn't really show off much new, I did find it fascinating seeing just a bit more of the Nomad life path in which V crosses the border into North Cali, some of the weather effects on full display, the verticality of Night City with intimidating skyscrapers dominating the view above us, and one of the random encounters of Night City Police Department Special Unit Maxtack destroying some goons was just fun to look at, but also a callback to the 2013 teaser trailer footage. That was a CGI trailer, and CD Projekt Red actually incorporated that into the real game. The official Cyberpunk 2077 Twitter account, as well as CD Projekt Red's head of animation, Sebastian Kalemba, referenced the moment recently acknowledging that it was inspired by that original 2013 trailer of Cyberpunk 2077. But another small and really cool detail from the PS5 gameplay was the fact that when Jackie speaks to V, some words are not translated, and that's actually highlighted in blue. Remember, to get the translation, you need to have the proper implant installed. This was a gameplay detail mentioned a couple of years ago, and it's it's just nice now to see it in action. But in terms of performance of the recent Xbox and PlayStation gameplay, it looks solid, but still many questions remain about the base consoles of the Xbox One and PlayStation 4. Just days ago, CD Projekt Red held their latest financial call with investors for quarter three, and a lot was revealed, especially in regards to post-launch plans and how the game supposedly runs right now. But that very important question about base console performance was brought up, and CDPR's CEO, Adam Kaczynski, responded by acknowledging the game does not run as well as it did on the Xbox One X or PlayStation 4 Pro, but it still, in their opinion, is surprisingly good, I would say, for such a huge world. Kaczynski later did single out the PlayStation versions of the game, saying about performance that PS5 is great, PlayStation 4 is still very good. I mean, we had those extra three weeks and we achieved a lot by within this final stretch, so we believe that the game is performing great on every platform. Now, getting back to the earlier part of this investor call, Adam Kaczynski actually opened it up, acknowledging 
acknowledging that right now they are their intensive. Now, getting back to the beginning of this investor call, Adam Kaczynski actually opened it up by acknowledging that right now they are in their intensive phase of their marketing and PR campaign. Review copies and such are going to be sent out to journalists and outlets very, very soon. And he also said that they are eagerly awaiting the moment for gamers to finally lay their hands on the game. In some slides, they just showed off some of the marketing that they've done for the game in New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, London, Paris, Warsaw, Hong Kong, and many more. They have adverts and giant billboards for the game up. Uh, actually, adverts in 55 countries to be more specific. The game's going to be available in 18 languages, uh, 18 subtitles, 10 with voiceovers. And then furthermore, in these slides, we also have all of the partnerships for this game. 20 plus global and local partnerships announced. More to come soon. Some of these include Sprite, Rockstar Energy, Adidas, Alienware, Nvidia, Xbox, Old Spice, Dark Horse, and so on and so forth. And really CD Projekt Red's executives just wanted to hype up the fact that this game is bits coming out. Yeah, no more delays. Now furthermore into this call, we got a lot of new details, especially in regards to bugs. That's been a big criticism so far in some of the previews for the game, uh, like outlets like IGN and Games Radar. As far as I remember, most of them were saying that yes, this is going to have to be fixed before the game does release, and CD Projekt Red have been pretty much acknowledging that they know there are bugs and it's going to be fixed in a day one patch. So anyway, Adam Kaczynski discussed this. He said the final game's bugs, however, will be on a level that will be as low as to let players not to see them. Specifically, he went on to say, so in terms of bugs, we are all aware of them. Of course, such a big game cannot be just bug free. That's kind of obvious, but we believe that the level will be as low as to let gamers not to see them, and fortunately, some bugs extended previous were caused by some general, I would say general features, and many of them are already fixed. So what gamers will get will be different from what previewers got recently in their builds. Now, Adam Kaczynski later in this call was also asked about the multiplayer game, which again is not connected to Cyberpunk 2077. He said the following. So first, we don't call it modes. It's a separate, dedicated production, a big production. We plan, we think about it as a standalone product. Obviously, it's not entirely standalone as it comes from the universe of Cyberpunk and is very much related to the concept of single player Cyberpunk we, I came up with. But from our perspective, it's another independent production and independent team of people working on it. And there's... I said already we are not focusing right now on talking too much about the other future products, products that are to be released after Cyberpunk. So please be with us in the first quarter of next year when we plan to share some strategy updates, and I believe Cyberpunk multiplayer will be possible, so it looks like our first update on what's going on with this multiplayer game will be sometime early 2021. Now, in addition to the multiplayer, we did get some news on Cyberpunk 2077's DLC reveals, in which Adam Kaczynski said the following. The initial plan was to do it before release, but after the recent delay, we decided to wait for the release to provide gamers with a game and then start talking about future projects. So after release. So initially my expectation a number of weeks ago was that we we're going to have a new Night City Wire episode, maybe one just dedicated to post-launch plans, because we have not heard anything so far about what free DLC is going to be like for Cyberpunk 2077. We of course don't have details so far on what the multiplayer game is going to look like, which is probably coming sometime in 2022, and then the story DLC expansions, which everybody's going to be hopefully hyped for after release of the main game, well, we haven't heard anything so far on that. That's why I suspected that we're going to have a Night City Wire dedicated just to that aspect, but right now it looks like those plans will be pushed off to probably the beginning of next year at the very earliest. But right now, some people have been running with uh, DLCs are already being delayed for Cyberpunk, and that's actually not true. It's just the announcement. The reveal has been delayed. Now, to a couple of other pieces of news that came from this investment call, CD Projekt Red revealed that Cyberpunk 2077's pre-orders are visibly higher than any Witcher title. And right now, CD Projekt Red expects at least 50% of early sales to be digital. None of this really should be surprising. The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt was CD Projekt Red's, well, their rise to fame in this AAA games industry. And so many people are hyped for Cyberpunk 2077 just because of the level of attention and care that we had with the Witcher 3 Wild Hunt. So uh, pre-orders being high for Cyberpunk, not very surprising. Now, an additional detail that was mentioned, this one's just a little bit maybe funny, uh, Keanu Reeves has played Cyberpunk 2077, and he loves it. That's according to CD Projekt Red. Adam Kaczynski said that he played the game, but as far as I know, he has not finished it yet. So, but definitely, he played the game, and he loves it. Which I don't really know what else uh, CD Projekt Red was going to say. It. It's not like they're going to come out and say that he doesn't like the game, but yes, it's cool. I guess Keanu has played it, and he likes it. Next, though, we're going to move on to some more Cyberpunk 
2077 News because recently Mike Pondsmith, the creator of the cyberpunk franchise, was interviewed by The Atlantic and he discussed a little bit about his experience in Night City so far in Cyberpunk 2077, in which he did acknowledge that he's not played a finished version of the game and this is just a moment that he mentioned from his experience. He said, I walk around, I go where I'm not supposed to go, I stand on street corners. It's great because there are moments where somebody walks by and they're having a real conversation and I listen in, just as I would on a real street. I'm thinking, well, it's not my business, but it does sound like an interesting story. And I just have to say that it's got to be such an amazing feeling to watch your universe brought to life in one of the most anticipated games in years. And it's also going to be pretty cool for players and fans of this franchise because Mike Pondsmith does have a role as supposedly a DJ in Cyberpunk 2077. So we'll be hearing him on one of the radio stations as we cruise through the streets of Night City. So that's going to be pretty cool. Now, this is probably not very surprising. This is something that happened with Red Dead Redemption 2 just days before release, and there is a Cyberpunk 2077 adult movie parody. Uh, not surprising at all. Uh, CD Projekt Red's business development director said that I guess mimicking is the highest form of praise, and I don't really know what else to say about this other than the fact that it's named Cyberpunk 2077 XXX Parody, but I feel like it would have been better suited for Cyberpunk 2069, but hey, that's just my suggestion. Recently, we did get some new Cyberpunk 2077 gameplay images with Hungarian subtitles. And these screenshots are actually very interesting because the first one is of a scene that we've seen quite a bit in Cyberpunk 2077 trailers, and that is of Adam Smasher crossing by, well, that being Evelyn Parker. We know that because the heads-up display is now here, and we can see that it is a brain dance, and Adam Smasher saying some very, um, unkind things. He says, in this rough translation, you look like a piece of effable meat, aren't you? And then, with some of the markers on the screen of this brain dance, at the upper right-hand corner, we have three objectives. We can scan the audio layer of Yorinobu Arasaka's phone call, we can scan the room's security system, and then we can watch the video over from Evelyn's perspective. Remember, she's supposed to be a working girl, but she's using her access to find a very important implant early in the game. But in the other screenshot, again, with Evelyn Parker, I believe this is them, V, having a sit-down with her at Lizzie's bar, and they're discussing their plan of crossing Arasaka and going over the operation. But next, we have some more technical Cyberpunk 2077 details that have been revealed. This is going to be important to most of you because the download size and the preload date have been supposedly leaked. And this is what has been revealed by PlayStation Game Size. They're saying that the base game is going to be 72 gigabytes. Right now, the update, there's no release date or any, any details on that yet. We have no idea what the size of it's going to be. I would imagine it's probably going to be pretty substantial. But the preload date right now is set for December 8th, and then the launch will again be the 10th but that date of 10th isn't actually very accurate, and I'm going to say that because right now, Cyberpunk 2077's release date in all time zones, it's going to be at the same time. It's going to be confirmed for 1 a.m. in Poland, not 12 a.m., and uh, what this means is that everybody will be playing the game 1 a.m. in Poland, so what this translates to is 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, December 9th in the United States, and on the East Coast where I live, uh, December 9th at 7 p.m., so you'll be playing the game five hours earlier. This is pretty cool because games like Red Dead Redemption 2, the people who got to play the game first were those living in New Zealand or Australia, having the game for about, what, 12 to 14 hours earlier? And I just kind of like this new way of going about things in which everybody plays the game for the first time at the exact same moment. I feel like that should be the way that this entire industry goes about releases. But for those who actually are buying Cyberpunk 2077 on Steam, it was recently announced that you'll be receiving a short story written by their story lead, Tomas Marshuka. It's called 2AM, She Calls, and it will show you the hostile streets of Night City as seen by Frank, an ex-NCPD officer, working the night shift as a combat cab driver. And then another announcement by the official Cyberpunk 2077 Twitter account was that all console players, if you start playing Cyberpunk 2077 on PlayStation 4 or Xbox One, you'll be able to continue playing it on a corresponding next-gen console. And then they detailed how cross-saves will work for both PlayStation and Xbox. PC gamers Andy Kelly 
recently got to play 15 hours of Cyberpunk 2077 in a controlled preview session. And recently they uploaded an article called There's Way More of The Witcher 3 in Cyberpunk 2077 Than You've Been Told. And first off, they discuss about the amazing characters and if there's going to be quests like The Witcher 3's Bloody Baron, which is kind of considered by many to be just one of the best side quests in all of gaming. And Andy said the following, he said that there are great performances in Cyberpunk and I get a real vibe of the Bloody Baron quest where there's a character called Judy Alvarez, who's a brain dance editor expert. You team up with her quite a lot in the story, so once you've ended your time with her in the story, you can then pursue loads more side quests to get to know the character, and she's actually one of the best characters. And then furthermore, they say that CDPR aren't going to show a scene in the big E3 trailer of Judy and V sitting on a bed having a heart to heart, but all that stuff's in there, which is really encouraging because I went in there with the same worries. Is it just going to be a future slang and people shouting mother effer and gangsters and all these really loud over the top characters but there's humanity there and it feels like it plays out in similar ways to some of the witcher quests and then andy then discussed v and how we can actually be a nice v and he's saying i think in those trailers and gameplay clips whoever's playing has chosen to be the edgelord douchebag v for the sake of the trailers whereas my v was nicer and way cooler i thought and then he says yeah you can be really nice which is quite surprising and this is just a good reminder that this again is a role-playing experience in which the story comes first, and yeah, you can make V be whoever you want V to be. Recently, Cyberpunk 2077 game designer Pavel Coppola gave us a very interesting insight into Cyberpunk 2077's quest design, saying, I just completed a certain quest in Cyberpunk 2077, and while I don't usually get emotional playing games, I had to pause and take a breather after this one. Our quest designers and writers created an insanely good experience. And then somebody asked, same level of emotions as the bloody barren storyline, and Pavel said, similar, more personal. Will not say more, this needs to be experienced. And then another designer, the lead quest designer for Cyberpunk 2077, Pavel Sasko, said, the whole studio is playing the game right now, and some devs experience certain stories for the first time. I hope that soon you will love it as much as Pavel did. But now we proceed forward to a new Cyberpunk 2077 interview with CD Projekt Red studio head Anna Badowski. It is a Polish interview, but we fortunately do have subtitles. And I just wanted to point out some of the interesting things that came from this interview, because Anna Badowski talks about the inspirations for the game, Night City as a character, Mike Pondsmith's role in the development, the verticality of this world which complicates comparisons with The Witcher 3 and the game's size, and he also discusses how the real world has, you know, kind of turned the cyberpunk franchise into a reality. But Adam Badowski also talked about the original vision from 2012 of creating a mature game about the dark future and whether or not that vision has changed, and he said specifically, no, that has not changed. We assumed it had to be a noir convention because that's what Mike's world is like. That's the cornerstone. So this is a game where even when the sun rises, it shows us the ashes after the night. And why do I think the game is mature? First, we're telling a story and we want our stories to be mature. What does this mean for cyberpunk? It means that this game is quite difficult in terms of the plot. I hope I won't be reprimanded by our PR specialist after saying the game has a difficult storyline. It's difficult in the sense that it's not a game about spectacular events, about explosions, actions led by great specialists in such jobs. It's a game about relationships between people in an oppressive world, and these relationships can be difficult, non-standard. Anyway, this path of our hero is such a path of transformation. I don't want to use big words here or reveal the plot to those who have not played it yet, and I'm also talking about death here, about topics that are not exactly popular in our medium, which is computer games. I would like to reassure our future players that the story is one of the most appreciated elements of our game. Now, Adam Badowski was also asked about V's role in the narrative of Cyberpunk 2077. Will he save the day? In which Adam said, we don't save worlds in our games as a rule, because then usually there's no room for the heroes that themselves, but V's relationships occur kind of on the sidelines of these great events. The final outcome is noir, so the world is just as evil or good or neutral as it was at the very beginning, but we have changed and we have changed our loved ones. And that's what our plot is about, how we deal with it. If we end up with more or less hope, it depends on the player, because as you know, choices are one of the key elements in our games. Badowski was asked if there will be joy or stories that include happy endings, and not those type happy endings, but Badowski said, yeah, of course, and anyway, the whole story of V will end well for everyone, I hope. What we're talking about is the path of the main character. I hope I won't reveal the main storyline, but the idea is to re-examine if everything I want in my life is my idea, or was it somehow programmed by the world? Is it something implanted in my mind like Johnny Silverhand? Or are these my own thoughts? Am I copying quotes from the world around me, believing these are my own thoughts? And this 
this theme dominates V's path. Adam Badowski did discuss the Nomads and the interviewer mentions how it's kind of like Mad Max in which Badowski says on one hand Mad Max but on the other hand we have to give a lot of thought to where Nomads come from. There is always a certain group of people that equates open spaces with freedom. On the other hand our world, our America has changed a lot. All the rich states are ruined, most of them only those that have access to the spacecraft launch sites matter because somewhere in orbit technological breakthroughs happen and are sent to the earth and the states control this. So with major changes in the states there were migratory movements. People travel like they did during the Great Depression in the USA. This is the basis for the emergence of the nomadic caste. People living outside the cities because it's easier to hide there. It seems the nomadic groups that they are less controlled. However, they are part and parcel of this economy just like the rest and they do work for corporations. Sometimes there is a chain of middlemen but in the end there is still in the black market controlled by corporations or by the system. And the system is a symbol of the fight for the identity of our hero V. Here we come back to Mike Pondsmith for whom this was very important. An individual that defies the system. Now, Badowski did discuss his favorite character in which he said, My favorite character is maybe not the most complicated one, but the coolest energetic one, Pan Am, a nomad, because we can consciously help her with the side quests and expand the main storyline with very cool events. There's a lot of melancholy sentimentality there. There's a lot about family, our old favorite tops from The Witcher. That's why I'm very fond of Pan Am. But getting into our next topic, we actually have some new gameplay footage that was recently shared by, I believe, a Japanese outlet. I believe it's Famitsu. Either way, we have an extension of the gameplay trailer which was shown during Night City Wire Episode 5. And what we have here is some new clips of scenes that have been extended a little bit longer and just some that were removed from the trailer probably for time. But we do have some interesting shots that I want to discuss. So I took screen caps of some of the most notable ones. The first one, we just have another overlook of the nighttime view of Night City. It looks beautiful, lots of activity going on in the streets, and we have cars driving by. To the next shot, we have an extension of the underwater gameplay play in which V and somebody else are going through the runes of an unknown part, maybe some of the wreckage of the fourth corporate war, maybe a mysterious part of the city that's no longer, it's underwater now, maybe there's a relic or something that we're looking for. Now the next shot we actually have a look at Pan Am, another shot of her, she's riding the car with us in the passenger seat, not much to make out of here, but it does look like we're going to be spending a lot of time with Pan Am, a pivotal character in Cyberpunk 2077 and of CDPR's studio head Adam Badowski, well it's his favorite character. To the next shot we just have another view of the sunny open world in which we have an NPC walking about, and then we have a very interesting scene because it looks like we have V being hacked. It says enemy netrunners, a hostile netrunner is trying to breach your system. New Neutralize him to stop the hack. And my curiosity is going to get the best of me, but I just wonder what is going to happen if we are hacked? Do we just automatically die? Does our health just go down a little bit? Does our screen start to glitch? That's just a very interesting gameplay mechanic that I'm very curious about how it's going to work. But then we get a scene of Jackie, it looks like this is the beginning or the start of the Arasaka job, which we'll have early on in the game in which we steal the implant. And then we have a scene from the Street Kid Life Path in which Padre is being intimidated by somebody else who's driving in an opposing vehicle, I believe that's a 6th Street gang member who's, while well, they're battling over territory at the time. And then we have another view of Johnny Silverhand in the northern oil fields on the outskirts of Night City. And then we have V making his way for the first time to his apartment in Watson. We know it's his first time because the apartment's just completely empty. And I guess my question with this would be, maybe throughout the game do we see his apartment grow in terms of what's actually inside of there? Then to the next shot we have uh, another flashback scene from Johnny's memories in which he's having a good time at a strip club in which uh, he's giving some shots to a stripper and yeah this is just some of the naughty aspects of the game, the maturity that you won't see in other AAA open world RPGs from other developers. But here this is another moment that was shown in the original gameplay video and it looks like some sort of mercenary with mantis blades that's after us and I believe Takamura is the one driving this vehicle because in the direct next shot we have what appears to to be V maybe in the verge of death with his screen you know glitching out and after we shoot and eliminate this you know mercenary that's after us Takamura takes our gun because we're obviously not very well. But continuing forward here we have an action packed scene in which it looks like V is battling it out with some Tiger Claw gang members, uh, some blood all over the screen and then to our last few shots we just have another look at the inventory system with some different outfits that V has on. The first one is very business centric Corpo and then we have a jacket, a different 
different one looks pretty cool. And then the final one, this is probably the most stylish one, and it's kind of like a snow leopard themed jacket. And while this does look very unique in style, in terms of rarity, these are all just common items that we'll find in Night City. I am kind of curious what the legendary ones may or may not look like. Now to the final part of this video, and I'm actually going to have the Japanese gameplay trailer running in the background, just in case if you haven't seen it, you'll see it now, but Alana Pierce recently had an interview or a Q&A session with a couple of journalists who got to play 16 hours of Cyberpunk 2077 recently. These journalists being IGN's Tom Marks and GameSpot's Phil Hornshaw, and Alana Pierce acted as an interviewer, asking various questions about their experience, and also took questions from the audience, and there was quite a bit revealed, a big special thank you or shout out out to Reddit user and poll for putting together a list of most of the talking points that came from this hour-long interview. But starting off, she asked about their overall impressions, and Phil said it was a fun RPG, and they compared it to Deus Ex. And then Tom said the preview left him wanting to play more, but he acknowledged that there are rough edges, but he's still excited. And then she asked how has melee and driving changed since the previous preview that they played back in, I believe, June, and Phil and Tom both agreed that melee was fine, and they kind of feel that it's kind of flavorful but it wasn't distractingly bad. And again, this is just a good moment to remind people that this is a story-focused RPG, and one of the big criticisms that came from The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt that I know a lot of people shared was that they just did not enjoy the combat enough. And I kind of do wonder if that's going to be, again, the case with Cyberpunk, but only time will tell. And I do have to wonder how much these previewers have actually invested into certain skills, because it has been said that you'll unlock better animations for certain weapons that you use for a longer period period of time. So I just do have to wonder if the maybe that impacts the fun factor in terms of using a katana against NPCs. But even in the background of this video, you'll see some gameplay, and personally I feel like it does look a lot better than what it did before, but again, this is a criticism that a lot of outlets have had for a while now. This isn't just coming from these two specific uh, previewers. GameSpot's Phil did reveal that it is possible to break and reestablish stealth. This is kind of like a normal core mechanic that you see in any of these type of games, but essentially you could be using a katana, take out an enemy NPC, another one may see you, and then they'll all be on alert in this certain level. And I guess over a period of time, eventually they'll go back to their normal patrols if they cannot find you. So kind of like any stealth game, but it is cool to see that it is here. And then Alana Pierce did ask what impact our life paths have on the experience. Tom said that there's a unique prologue, as we already know, and there are unique dialogue choices that were impactful and could color your conversations based on your background. Phil echoes the similar sentiment to Tom, notes that you can see choices you could have picked in other life paths. And there are some spoilery moments that they have in this interview, I'm not really going to touch on any of the story related stuff, but Tom did say that the cyberpunk has the pace of an RPG and not an action game. Tom and Phil said the RPG elements let you expand your approach beyond just run and gun. And then they were asked, how do you feel about combat overall? Phil said it's fun, but it starts slow. You are not the strongest at the beginning and need to be deliberate about how you fight. Tom again echoes Phil's point and elaborates that your experience in combat can radically change as you get different weapons, abilities, etc. Again, this is what I said earlier, improving on skill progression, things like that. You get better animations as you, you know, progress. Now, IGN's Tom was asked about what happens when you die, and there's nothing, you know, spectacular here. You just restart at a checkpoint like in any normal game, but he did emphasize the fact that being that this is a role-playing experience, you'll be quick saving a lot. And again, you will not be able to quick save during combat encounters, but again, the key to this game is just quick saving as much as you can. And I found this question actually very interesting, which Alana asks, what do you anticipate the initial public reaction to be? Tom says it's going to be like The Witcher 3, which is regarded as a masterful game, even with its launch issues. And then Phil said, I think it's going to be fine. Now in regards to Johnny Silverhand and how he is, Phil says that he's not always there, there's a comparison that they make to Cortana, but the relationship between V and Johnny is just somewhat antagonistic, it's not great because Johnny's an ass, but it is is influenced by our decisions. Tom does agree with Phil, and he gives an example about how Silverhand plays well into the quest system, and which specifically, V will be entering into a market, somebody may be playing on a guitar, and then Johnny actually just starts, you know, talking about, I guess, the music that's being played, and that may trigger a quest. They Pretty much, they just say it's very natural. Now, he does give a very interesting hot take, in which he says that while the voice cast, the performances in Cyberpunk 2077 are very good, he says that Keanu Reeves may be the weak link. 
and he does say that it's not terrible, but I guess it does stick out a little bit, but he overall just says that his performance is, it's fine, it's decent, it's good. Now to the next question, Alana asks how populated is the world, and this is very important because I know a lot of people are very curious about population uh, density, and Phil says, I thought it was pretty dense, and he notes that there were minor bugs, but nothing that majorly detracts, and then Tom was impressed by the density, so that's good news. But in regards to styles, and if people change as we move through the city, Phil does say that that is the case, and then they were both asked, did either of them get into the romance options? Phil says that he didn't get far enough into the story to really experience enough, but he did pick up a, a worker, and he described first-person adult scenes. We talked about that in a recent video. Check it out if you haven't already. And then Tom tells a story about inadvertently launching an adult scene with a CD Projekt Red developer in the room, and the quest reward was literally a dildo on a bat. No joke. But Tom specifically says that this is a scene that he just had no idea was happening. Pretty much it's just a quest. He was told to go to a hotel room and when he goes to the hotel room he opens the door and I guess an NPC is laying on the bed and then well action happens so yes it seems like uh, there's going to be some surprise scenes but he did say that he had to make some unique dialogue options to get this so again just replayability with this game is going to be extremely key but Phil and Tom did say that neither of them experienced romance firsthand CD Projekt Red was tight-lipped about it to avoid spoilers honestly though I gotta say that I am a little bit surprised hearing that that certain Certain romance weapon, I don't even know if you can call it romance, dildo on a bat. That is something that I did not expect, but maybe I should have with Cyberpunk 2077, but my curiosity is going to get the best of me. Are we going to have like a crafting menu in which we can edit this further? And how effective a weapon is it? I, I just, I'm getting too much into this. Anyway, let's next discuss side quests, because Phil says that they felt pretty organic for himself, and they can branch into multi-part quests. Both of them did agree that side quests explore a large tonal range, from extremely dark topics to very light-hearted stuff and then when they were asked about can they dramatically change your appearance with cyberware Phil says that he thinks that you can find places to change your appearance I had crazy nails Tom says directly in the character creator it mentions that you can do cool stuff with your eyes and have some cosmetic cyberware in your face and this is probably the most disappointing part of this entire interview in which Alana asks how often did they see themselves and Tom says make sure you're happy with your fingernails you'll see yourself in the inventory you'll see yourself if your activity turns a mirror on and you'll see yourself if if you're driving in third person, but well, basically that's it. Now to the last couple of questions from this interview, there was a question about brain dances in which Phil says they're cool, it's interesting, and typically integrated into the story. He feels that they're good at helping you understand the information that propels the story. Tom said that they aren't very hard, there's clear markers to help you find what you're looking for, and he enjoyed it more than the detective stuff in the Witcher franchise. And the final question was what was their favorite literal parts of the game? Tom said that he just really enjoyed the game. Night City, it feels alive, plus the main story is very engaging. Phil says, the characters. The story does a very good job giving you time to spend with all of these compelling characters. Anyway, before we do wrap up this video, I wanted to bring up a quote that Mike Pondsmith made a long time ago, and it's been recently brought back up because a CD Projekt Red developer commented on it. Mike Pondsmith said a while ago, when CDPR approached us, what we realized really rapidly was these guys are fans. These guys know the material. They're quoting things back to me I forgot. They just got it. You have to be able to understand why this world exists. And a CD Projekt Red developer, Fabian Mario Dola, said, every time I read, I don't think CD Projekt Project Red understands what cyberpunk really is. And I mean, there's just been so much outrage, controversy over the years, and that comment specifically, CDPR doesn't understand what they're doing with this cyberpunk genre. I don't know how many times I've seen it before, but it's just a surreal feeling. We're only a couple of days away from experiencing it. We can drown out all of this, these really weird and bad takes that people have had, especially the ones over the years. But yeah, right now we are in the end game. Cyberpunk 2077, single digits, just days away from release. And yeah, I'm more excited excited than I've ever been and it's just been a hell of a ride with all of you and again we'll continue after launch so hopefully we'll be getting excited for story DLC expansions. But anyway let me know your thoughts on everything that we did discuss today down in the comment section below but thank you for watching. Make sure to leave a like if you did enjoy this video or if you found any informative value and make sure to follow my other social media accounts for updates on new videos. Links are always down in the description below. I'm most active on Twitter giving opinions on news that I do not always get into video form so do make sure to follow me over there. Also check out my Discord for all sorts of discussion on games. And again, thank you for joining. Consider subscribing for more videos like this, and I'll see you later.